Assalamu alaikum. Now we are going to talk about femur. Femur or the thigh bone is the longest and the strongest bone of the body. It has, like any other bone, an upper end, a shaft, and a lower end. These are the typical features for long bones. For the side determination, the upper end bears this rounded head. This rounded head is directed medially whereas the lower end is expanded in the transverse plane and somewhat flattened as compared to its transverse axis in the anteroposterior direction. The posterior side of the shaft is ridged and the anterior side is convex forwards. So when we look at it, this bone becomes the bone of the left side of the leg. For the anatomical position, the head is directed medially upwards and slightly forwards. The shaft is di directed obliquely and medially so that the two condyles they lie in the same transverse plane. So like this. The shaft is directed slightly oblique and medially in the normal anatomical position. Now we are going to talk about the upper end of femur. The upper end of the femur includes a head, a neck, a greater trochanter, a lesser trochanter, intertrochanteric crest on the posterior side and the intertrochanteric line on the anterior side. If we look at them individually, the head of the femur is formed almost of more than half a sphere, three-fourths of a sphere. This head is directed medially forwards and upwards. The head of the femur articulates with the acetabulum of the hip bone to form the hip joint. There are There is a roughened pit situated almost below the center of the, fee, of the head and this pit is called fovea. If we look at the neck of the femur, it is the part that joins the head with the shaft of the femur. This neck in itself has an upper border, a lower border, a posterior surface and an anterior surface. The upper border of the neck is almost concave and horizontal. It joins the head of the femur with the greater trochanter. The lower border is almost oblique and straight, this one. It is almost oblique and straight and it joins the head with the lesser trochanter of the femur. If we look at the anterior surface, it joins the head with the intertrochanteric line on the shaft of the femur. This whole surface is almost always intracapsular. The cap it is covered by the capsule of the hip joint. The posterior surface is convex from above downwards and concave from side to side. The medial portion of this surface is covered by the joint capsule. It joins the head uh, to the shaft at the intertrochanteric crest. The neck makes an angle with the shaft which is almost always 125 degrees in the adults. If we look at the greater trochanter, it is a quadrangular prominence located on the upper part of the shaft at the junction of the shaft with the neck. All of this is the greater trochanter. The greater trochanter has an upper border which has an apex. It has an interior surface, a medial surface, this part, and a lateral surface. So the upper border, uh, the crater trochanter has an apex superiorly. It has a lateral surface, a medial surface, and an anterior surface. The anterior surface is rough in its lateral part and is smooth on the medial side. 
the lateral surface is roughened and in its middle has an oblique ridge the medial surface on its superior part is rough and below it has an intertro it has a trochanteric fossa the lesser trochanter of the femur is conical in its projection and it is directed medially but backwards it is present at the junction of the lower border of the neck with the shaft the intertrochanteric line which is present in the anterior side of the upper end starts from the antero inferior part of the greater trochanter where there is a tubercle and it moves downwards towards a spiral line that is present this spiral line that is present in front of the lesser trochanter this spiral line then moves towards the posterior side of the shaft this is the roughened ridge like intertrochanteric line on the anterior side of the upper end now this part the projected rounded prominence is called the intertrochanteric crest it runs between the greater trochanter and moves towards the lesser trochanter almost in its middle it also has a tubercle if we look at the attachments on the upper end of the femur first of all we have this fovea this fovea gets the attachment of the ligamentum teres or ligamentum femoris if we look at the greater trochanter first we said that it had an apex this apex gets the attachment of piriformis then the medial surface uh, on the rough part it gets the attachment of obturator internus and the two gemelli the obturator externus is inserted into the trochanteric uh, fossa on the anterior surface we said that it had a rough part this rough lateral part on the anterior surface gets the attachment of gluteus minimus then the lateral surface had a ridge this ridge gets the attachment of gluteus medius on the lesser trochanter the apex of the lesser trochanter gets the attachment of psoas major iliacus is inserted on the anterior surface and the base of the trochanteric um, of the lesser trochanter and the posterior surface of the lesser trochanter is related with the bursa the intertrochanteric line gets the attachment of upper and lower bands of the iliofemoral ligament the upper band is present in the upper part and the lower band of the iliofemoral ligament is attached to the lower part all of this line gets the attachment of capsular ligament of the hip joint highest fibers of vastus lateralis are attached to the upper end and the highest fibers of vastus medialis are attached on the lower end of the intertrochanteric line posteriorly we had this tubercle which is called the quadrate tubercle on the intertrochanteric crest this quadrate tubercle gets the attachment of quadratus femoris now if we look at the shaft of, uh, of the femur the shaft is almost cylindrical it is narrowest in the middle and it widens above as well as below but the lower part is wider as compared to the upper part it is convex forwards the all of the anterior surface is convex and the posterior surface in the middle has a prominent ridge which is called linea aspera to discuss the shaft we'll, we are going to divide it into three parts the upper third the middle third and the lower third of the shaft in the middle third as it is the easiest what we can see is that we describe it as that the shaft has a medial border a lateral border and a posterior border a medial and the lateral borders both of these borders are rounded but the posterior border is in the form of a ridge this ridge is called linea aspera and if we closely look at the shaft we can see that the linea aspera has a lateral and a medial lip so this shaft has three borders a medial border 
a lateral border and a posterior border and in turn it will have three surfaces in the middle part an anterior surface between the medial and the lateral borders a medial surface and the lateral surface the medial and lateral surfaces are directed posteromedially and posterolaterally now, all of this is the anterior surface now if we move towards the upper end what we see is that the medial and the lateral lips of the linea aspera they diverge on both sides to medially it continues with the spiral line or the pectineal line laterally it continues with the gluteal tuberosity so as the posterior border got divided into two separate crests or lines the pectineal or spiral line and the gluteal tuberosity now this surface is going to have four borders the medial border the spiral line the gluteal tuberosity and the lateral border as it has four borders so it will have four surfaces the largest convex anterior surface between the medial and the lateral borders medial and the lateral borders between the medial and the spiral line is the medial surface between the spiral line and the gluteal tuberosity is the posterior surface between the gluteal tuberosity and the lateral border is the lateral surface also this happens in the lower end now if we talk about the lower end that same linea aspera which had a medial and a lateral lip they move or diverge on both sides in the lower part they form supracondylar lines the medial and the lateral supracondylar lines so again the lower part has four borders and four surfaces the medial rounded border the medial supracondylar line the lateral supracondylar line and the lateral border in turn this surface will have four surfaces uh, this part will have four surfaces the anterior surface the largest surface the medial surface this triangular popliteal surface and the lateral surface the medial supracondylar line and the medial surface meet in the lower end and they almost obliterate the medial surface inferiorly 